So we do have a teacher for the 9 to 12 year olds, so 9 to 12 year olds are dismissed as well. Good morning. Morning, morning. Did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Yes. Awesome. 1.40 Friday morning, I was cleaning up turkey mess. <laughs> we cooked, let me, let me count, 38 pounds of turkey. And it is all gone. <laughs> Every bit of it and some chicken we had left over. Um, so what season is it? Thank you. Um, last week we talked about being thankful for the cross. And this is kind of the second part to last week because um, if you have your Bible, we're gonna look at two passages today. Um, open up to Revelation. 21, and mark it, put your finger there or, or put a piece of paper there or something because we're going we're gonna to get to Revelation 21 here in a little bit. Uh, we're going to start off in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, by the way, everybody turn around and look at Dennis. <laughs> Dennis is here today. That is an answer to prayer. So we are thrilled that you are well enough to be here, Dennis. Oh, me too. <laughs> um, okay, so last week we talked about being thankful for the cross. This week, we're kind of tagging that together because... The empty tomb is what proved the cross was efficacious. It, it proved that the cross was effective. It did what Jesus said it would do. And we're going to look a little bit at why this is significant to Christians. Because in, in Corinthians, there were a number of issues that Paul had to deal with in Corinthians. Whose kids are those disrupting service? <laughs> Pastor's kids. Um, and, and he had to deal with a number of things going on in the church. And interestingly enough, there are a lot of things that we deal with today. But one of the things that Paul has to address is the resurrection. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, he's carrying on this thought about the resurrection. And I'm going to kind of read through this chapter. And then I want to go back and I want to highlight just a couple of key thoughts out of this. <clears throat> now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the, wor the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, what was the word that he preached to them? We talked about that last week. He preached Christ and Christ crucified. While he was among them, he determined that he would not deal with any other issue than Christ crucified. Okay? So this is the word that he's talking about. So, verse 3, For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. 
but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. That is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Okay, so now he just made a huge introductory statement to say what he's going to say. Okay, the, the crux of what we want to get here is that, one, the message that was preached that they believed in was the cross and says he was he died for our sins in accordance with the scripture that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures okay so this is the message that he delivered this is the core of what every message I want to preach should be around this is the basis of it okay so then he goes through and he starts listing the proofs of the resurrection. He says, he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve, which is a name for the apostles that Jesus drew out of the disciples, okay? And then 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So right now we have 512 plus, as the number keeps going. Then he appeared to James. This is not James, the disciple, the apostle. This is the brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. Okay. Um, how weird would that be? You, you ever think about James? You think about the brothers of Jesus? Why can't you be like your brother? <laughs> I mean, really, are you, you going to try and thump on God? I mean, it, it had to be a bizarre situation for them. Because we know at one point early in Jesus' ministry, they came along with mom and said, hey, you, you're getting yourself in trouble. Come home with us. And at one point, they even kind of smart-mouthed them. Hey, aren't you going up to Jerusalem? You know, show your stuff. You know? But he was dead, and now he's alive. If one of my brothers goes in the grave and then shows up later, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to freak. Okay? So, it appears to James, then to all the apostles, and then last, to me. Okay? Not me, Glenn, me, Paul, the writer. Okay? So, he's, he's laying out all of these proofs. And he's even naming names. So there is eyewitness accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. All right? So he's laid this out. And now in verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay? Now this, this is a, a point of theology at this time, okay? Because remember when the Sadducees came to Jesus and they gave him the tall tale? A man and a woman were married and he died, so she married his brother and he died and she married the next brother and he died and I'm wondering where the investigation is. <laughs> Thinking, that's not right. And then all the way down, all seven of the brothers died. <coughs> And they're really trying to corner Jesus. They're trying to catch him in a trap because the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And so they're trying to make this bizarre, twisted, convoluted reasoning to prove there's no resurrection. And Jesus doesn't even deal with their question directly. As a matter of fact, he kind of slaps them down. And he says, God is the God of Isaac Abraham, Jacob, he's the God of the living, not the dead. And then he says, you, you don't even know the scriptures. And then he, he, he lays out his defense for the resurrection. Okay? So Paul is, is looking at this right here. Um, now, now keeping in mind, what is happening at the church at this time? We've, we've got to get a, a little bit of history here. Okay? When Paul went through the churches... We see in uh, the book of Acts, uh, it's about 
13, 14, and 15 in that area. Um, every time he goes to a, a city, he would go in and he would first go to the synagogue. And they would invite him and, and Barnabas up to speak and to share what God had shown them and, and any insight that they would have, and they would preach the gospel. Okay? And at first it was received with joy, with excitement, with interest. And then the word would spread and the Gentiles would start coming because they wanted to hear it. Okay? Now God, I believe, was really pushing Paul to the Gentiles. He knew he was called to preach to the Gentiles. And God was making a statement, I didn't call you to the Jews, I called you to the Gentiles. Because when the Gentiles started coming, the Jews all of a sudden didn't want anything to do with it. Oh! And, and as Paul and Barnabas would go from city to city, the Jews would follow and start persecuting them. Now, the first Christians were Jews. You understand that? Okay. We need to understand this. Because when God chose Abraham, he said that out of you will come a blessing to the world. Okay? So, the first Christians were Jews. And Christ was a Jew. He was a practicing Jew. And he did those things that Jews do, but he did them in a right understanding and a right relationship. Okay? So... The Jews started to reject the word. And what, what was kind of interesting is there were some that rejected it outright and said, no, we want nothing to do with this. Paul was one of those. At the time he was called Saul. Now we're going to beat you into submission. Okay? And others, though, accepted it with condition. We want to take the gospel and we want to just insinuate it into the law. It doesn't overwhelm, it doesn't eliminate, it doesn't fulfill the law, we just want to add it to. And so, these Jews are seeing all these Gentiles coming in, and they say, yeah, 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 it's good that you've received this, but in order to do this right, you need to add this and this and this and this and this. You need to be circumcised, you've got to follow the, the, the Torah, you need to follow all the, the rules, the traditions, all of these things need to be done. Okay? And so we see that, that this whole thing is being built and it's being twisted around. And, and Paul is saying, no, this, this whole purpose, he came to fulfill the law. You can't earn your salvation through the law. Neither can you maintain your salvation through the law. The law has been fulfilled. So let's get back, back into Corinthians. Okay. And when the Jews come in and they're trying to confuse all this thinking, the Sadducees had to come in with them too, right? The Sadducees, we know some had to be saved. And they're bringing this theology in that there is no resurrection from the dead. Okay? So this, this idea, this little passage right here, um, Paul is saying, you know, how can you say there's no resurrection of the dead? Okay? This is a very well-known idea in the, the Jewish churches at this time. Now, as the Gentiles are coming in, they're coming in ignorant, okay? Because they're pagans. They, they don't understand anything. They don't have the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible. They don't understand what this is built on. And the New Testament is being written. So the only thing they have to look at are the Jews. So depending what Jews they're listening to, this theology that there's no resurrection of the dead became very popular, all right? at least in Corinth. So, now that I've explained verse 12, verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Okay, so now he's taking their philosophy to its logical conclusion. Okay, if you believe that there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised. Now there's a series of events that he says that really make a bad picture because if there is no resurrection of the dead then all of these things have to be true okay if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain okay our preaching our, our proclaiming is fruitless it, it's, it's wasted and not only that your faith 
is of no value. Because the basis of what we are believing is not just that Jesus went to the cross and took our place, but that God raised him back up from the dead. Okay? This is important that we really understand and really grasp this as a central tenet of what we believe. Okay? So your faith would be in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise, if it is true, the dead are not raised. So basically, what they're saying is we're liars. And, and we're calling God a liar. Okay? So if re there's no resurrection, if there's no empty tomb, then Christ wasn't raised, everything is in vain, and God's a liar. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been re raised. He's reiterating his point. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Now, okay, so if he hasn't been raised, then the cross was fruitless. There is no redemption. Okay? Because the resurrection is proof that the cross was effective. Okay? It's proof that the price that was paid was found sufficient. Okay? So if there is no resurrection, then there is no redemption. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. There's no heaven. This is, this is getting pretty gloomy, isn't it? If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. Okay? He is, has taken the logical process of this twisted, convoluted theology and taking it out to where it would really lead. And it's not good. So now I've, I've just kind of broad brushed a picture of the significance, the importance, the value of the empty tomb. Because if the tomb is not empty, then all of these things would be true for us as well. The preaching's been in vain. Our faith has been in vain. God is a liar. Christ has not been raised. We will not be raised. There is no redemption. There is no heaven. There is no reward. So now let's take that whole thing and let's turn it completely upside down to what it is, and we're going to reread this passage in a positive light. Okay? So we're going to back up. So there is a resurrection, and Christ has been raised. Okay? We start there. And if Christ has been raised, then our preaching is not in vain, and your faith is not in vain. God is not a liar. Reiterating, Christ has been raised. Your sins are forgiven. You have been redeemed. The price has been paid in full. Those who have fallen asleep are even now in the presence of the Lord. And we of all people have hope. And we of all people have reason for thanksgiving. See, Paul is addressing this thing according to the logical flow of their thought. But if we turn that on its ear, the way that Paul is making them look foolish, he's being sarcastic. If we turn this around and look at it, this is an incredible thing to be thankful for. If Christ is raised, then we'll be raised. Our faith is not in vain. Our, our faith is, is, is proven true. God is not a liar. He's faithful. So, I'm going to take this 
to one step further because one of the things that he says here in verse 18 is those who have fallen asleep with Christ have perished. We turn that upside down and, and Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, right? Okay. Where is the Lord? Where is our Lord Jesus right now? He is, he is at the right hand of God. He is ever interceding for us before the Father. Okay? And he's knocking together some suitable place for us. Now, think about that for a moment. I, I love the Keith Green song. God created everything in six days. Right? Everything that was made was done in six days. Jesus said, I am going now to prepare a place for you. He's been working at this for 2,000 years. Evidently, streets of gold are not easily done. So let's flip over to Revelation 21. Because here we have been looking backwards to what God has done, the cross, the resurrection. Now we're going to turn our gaze forward. And this is something that really, really, it actually saddens me quite a bit. You know, as, as Christians, we don't spend a lot of time talking about, thinking about, relishing in what is to come. See, salvation is good in this life, but it's unto something. This isn't it. Okay? This is a very poor shadow of what will be. And we don't spend enough time dwelling on what will be. We get so caught up in life. And there's a lot going on in life. Life makes sure of that. We, with all these inventions and all these technological gizmos and doodads, we have less free time now than we ever have in the history of the world. Because we're always doing something. And we don't like to be still. That's not true. Christy does. <laughs> she loves days where she can just veg. <coughs> And I think she also looks at those days with a little bit of fear because I don't veg. I get impatient. Let's do something. So let's look at the revelation that John was given about what's coming. Okay? I'm going to hit just a couple of passages in here. And I want to draw your attention to a, a number of key thoughts about what's coming. Okay? So in verse 20, I mean chapter 20, verse 1. I'm sorry, 21, verse 1. Let me try this again. Revelation 21, verse 1. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. <clears throat> No sea? Can you, can you comprehend and wrap your brain around no sea? I can't. <coughs> um, to me, that, that makes the earth look incomplete. There was no sea. Hmm. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There are two times that I have been told that a woman looks at her absolute most beautiful. And they are two very different times. One is at her wedding day. And she has spent time and money to prepare herself for this day. That when she comes down the aisle and her husband to be looks down the aisle and sees his heart go, Okay, and all the people turn and they look and they go, wow, she's beautiful. 
beautiful. The other time is when a woman gives birth. And this new life is placed in her hands. And there is this glow. I've seen it five times. <coughs> the two don't compare. It's like the beauty of a diamond <coughs> ring compared to the beauty of a majestic landscape. You, you, can't, you can't really compare them side by side. But both are equally beautiful. Okay? But this, this picture of a bride, New Jerusalem coming down, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a, a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Now this, if this right here does not excite you, you don't understand what your faith is about. Okay? That on that day, we will get to dwell in the revealed magnificence of the presence of God. Well, we can't really even wrap our brains around that because no one can see God and live. Yes. Not this life, but in a new life we can. Okay? So this passage right here, God is speaking and he says, I will dwell with you and you with me. Now, think about that for a moment because we know of one place that God dwelt in that presence before and that was the mercy seat. And you think about all the preparation that had to be done for the one time a year a person was actually allowed to go in before the revealed presence of God, the Shekinah glory. And you didn't do so lightly, okay? This presence that we will have is going to far outweigh that presence. So he will be our God, now look at verse 4. I love this. <laughs> he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Think about that. There are no reasons for tears. There's, there's no separation. There will never be a time where we will have to say goodbye to a person because they've gone somewhere we can't go. No death, no mourning, no, no pain. No pain. Can you imagine what that feels like? I mean, most of us, we get to a certain point and our body lets us know we can't do the things we used to do. But no pain of any sort. Verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Does that sound familiar? See, the first time that was said, the price has been paid. Price has been paid. Second time that he's saying that, because everything that the sin had brought in is wiped away. It's gone. All the corruption. I mean, think about this for a moment. The thing that this creation that we see is nothing like what it was intended to be. Okay? Nothing like it was intended to be. Every occurrence that I've heard about people having visions or going to heaven, or one thing always stands out to me. Everybody's got their different things, and I've heard dozens of them. But one thing always jumps out at me, the colors. The colors. Now, we have beautiful trees in the fall here, and I love all the different colors, the reds, the yellows, the oranges. I, I love the colors. Some of you guys have incredible flower gardens. We don't. We have flower pots that get planted 
and then die. <laughs> and I feel so bad for those flowers when I bring them home because I've sentenced them to death. <laughs> and, but some of you have beautiful, and I look at these flowers and I'm thinking, well, oh, this is incredible. But think if we can see color in three dimensions, the depth, the richness, the hues, the variety. I'm making all things new. It is done. All the corruption, everything that was, was warped is taken away. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. Doesn't that kind of sound like Isaiah? Is it Isaiah? 55. Is that 55? I was going to say 53, I was off. Isaiah 55, he says, Come and get wine and bread without cost, at no, no price to you. And here he's saying, um, I will give you the waters from the spring of life with no payment. Why? Because he's already paid the price. He paid it. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be the lake, uh, in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which was the second death. Now those are the people that names were not found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, so if you've told a lie, you're not kicked out because his blood has covered that sin. You stand before God with imputed righteousness, the blood of Christ having paid for all of your sins. So any of these that fall in here that you have committed, if you have believed, you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are serving him, you th these don't apply to you. Now, that is not carte, not carte blanche for you to go and do these sins. Because now, you don't just represent yourself. You represent him. You're his ambassador. And you've got to represent the king of kings. Okay? So, all of these, not allowed in. Let's look at verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Okay. In Jerusalem, they have a, a, a law that all the buildings have to be made of Jerusalem stuff. And so all the buildings have the same look, and it, it's white. It's kind of an off-whitish color. And if you saw any of the pictures that we posted, all the buildings have that same. Now you can do different textures and you can do different shapes, but they all have the same material. But, but I, I can't fathom a city that looks clear as crystal. I mean, Jerusalem is, is beautiful. There's, you stand off up on Mount Scopus, and you look down on it, and, and there's a beauty that's there. But a most rare jewel like a jasper clear as crystal? Verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, twelve angels, and on the gates, the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. And on them were the names, were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now that's interesting. Twelve <coughs> apostles of the Lamb. Who do you suppose names are on them? Because we know the 12 disciples, right? Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip. Can I use your hand? <laughs> Put your hand up. <laughs> Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. All right, put them up. You got two. You've only got two. There's 12. All right? But Judas fell, right? Okay, you can put it down. So now there's 11. 
there's a whole theory that I, I really am coming to believe is true. Um, Mino Kalischer writes a book on the, uh, wrote a book on the book of Galatians. And one of the things that he says is in the introduction of Galatians, Paul writes that he is an apostle appointed of Jesus Christ and God. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we see that the disciples came together and they drew, they had a, a pool of players of which two fit the criteria that they determined were necessary to, to bring the number of 12. Okay? And they, they drew a name and we had a 12th apostle added through the workings and the machination of man. Okay? But Paul declares himself to be an apostle appointed of God, not of man. So whose name is going to be on that 12th layer? Isn't that, isn't that a curious thought? So 12 layers. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going to skip down. Okay, we're going to go down. Uh, he measures it. Uh, it's 12,000 stadia, length, width, and height, so it's a cube. Um, verse 18, the wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. I, I, I've seen gold, but I've never seen clear gold. And I, I honestly, I have a hard time trying to wrap my brain around this, trying to fit this in my head. Um, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, chrysoprase, uh, the eleventh jacinth, the this, this jacinth, how do you say that? Jacinth. Um, the twelfth amethyst. Jewels forming the foundation. This is the place that we get to go in and out of. This is the new capital, okay? And as, as cool as this is, I mean, let's finish reading this. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each of the gates was made of a single pearl. Can you imagine the size of the oyster? <laughs> wow! No wonder it's taken him so long. <laughs> And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Okay, so we've got this incredible picture. Pearl gates. Gemstones for the foundation. The city and the, the street of pure gold. And yet that's not what makes it so beautiful. Okay. What makes it beautiful is, back up to verse 3, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Okay? Yeah, all that stuff is beautiful. I mean, think about it. David and Solomon built a, an incredible temple for the dwelling place of God. It was, it was beautiful. David had it all planned out. He had all the resources pulled together, and he told Solomon, build it like this. And Solomon built it like that. But the entire city is made of gold. Now let's, let's look down here in verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp. What kind of light do you suppose that's going to be? I mean, we're going to have to have some pretty awesome eyes to be able to deal with that. Because his, his radiance outshines the sun. We're not going to need the sun and the moon anymore because he's going to be there with us. And he's not going to be dimmed in, in the flesh of humanity. Okay? He is going to be God revealed in all of his splendor. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. 
Remember we, earlier in Revelation, it talks about the, the crowns that we will be given and we're going to cast them at his feet and there's, a, there's the rewards that we're going to be receiving. And, and what we're going to take that into the city, the glory that is given us for the things that we have done. And we're, see what it says there? They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. They're, they're bringing the glory back to God because whose glory is it really? It's only given to us because of him and it's only because of what we've done for him that we even get any of it. So it's all his. Okay? And they're bringing it into him. And I mean, can you imagine what it would be like here I come toting along my, my wheelbarrow full of whatever he's given me and I'm taking it across solid gold streaks through gates of pearl across all the gemstones and I got my little wheelbarrow. In fact, I'm really going to impress God, huh? But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, now verse, uh, chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the waters of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Okay. Now, I, I know there's this kind of idea that some of us have grown up with, that you know heaven is going to be us floating on clouds playing harps. <laughs> no. No. Because in, in, in that description, I didn't see any mention of clouds or harps. Okay? I saw glory and honor. I didn't see clouds and harps. Okay? So we have got to get out of our heads this idea, this, this whatever this ridiculous, comical, cartoonish idea of what we think heaven is because Corinthians tells us that we can't really wrap our brain around what it's going to be like. Okay? God gave us small heads because we have small brains. Okay? And we, we need to start trying to grasp a hold of what is to come. Okay? In this life, yeah, we thank God we, we glory in the fact that he has forgiven us our sins. But in the next life, when, we, when all of this is done, whether it be because we graduate or because he comes back, we have something of so much greater worth and value than anything we have here. And I don't care what kind of cool stuff you think you've got here, it's not worth a cobblestone of Gold Street or the privilege of walking on it. Okay? So, <clears throat> no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. See, this is practice, folks. When we come together to worship, this is practice for what's going on there. And I, I tell you, Shut your eyes during worship. If you stand anywhere close to me during worship, don't listen to the words I sing because I don't. some of the songs I don't have memorized, and even the ones I have memorized, I get caught up in my, in my head and I make up words. And I just sing along and, and occasionally I'll catch somebody looking at me going, Hey man, I'm worshiping. God knows what I mean. Okay? Um, I don't think I've memorized an entire song in my life. Okay. Worship him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. And that's a long, long time. Now, I'm going to jump over here. Um, we're going to jump all the way down to 17. 
Okay? So, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the waters of life without price. See, this is the, the, the natural response. See, this is what we're looking forward to. This is the end result. This is the finish line. Okay? And don't take your eyes off the finish line. When you run a race, don't look at the other runners. Don't look at the spectator. Don't look at the bird. Look at the finish line. Set your eyes, fix your gaze on the finish line, and press on until you cross it. It's too easy to get caught up. Uh, I'm beating that guy. Oh, that guy's way ahead of me. Hey, look at that person up on the third row. What's he doing? Bird! <laughs> it's too easy to get distracted. Life is noisy and it clutters. Set your gaze, fix your eyes, on the finish line and press on because the spirit that lives inside of you is calling out come and your natural response should be come amen mm -hmm. amen father we bless you today i thank you lord god that your word has shown us what was showing us what is and tells us what is to come. Father, we have seen how man has ruined everything that you set into place. But Father, your plan was before creation. You made a way for us to be redeemed. You made a way that we could come before you and stand in righteousness, not of our own. You made a way, Father, so that at the end of all things, we can be with you forever. We can be in your magnified glory, your revealed presence. And Father, the, the city of Jerusalem that, that you are building to bring down, even that is diminished in the light of your grace, the light of your presence. I thank you, Father, that you've given us a taste, a glimpse of the things that you have prepared for us in eternity. Help us, Father, to fix our eyes, to set our hearts, to be unflinching, to press on to the prize, Father. We thank you, we praise you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.